Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to this evening's wonderful webinar. I'm sure you haven't been in any webinars today, yesterday, the day before, or a couple of minutes ago, right? Anyway, this is the best one. Why? Because we're talking about women and female empowerment and celebrating the Commission on Status of Women, celebrating Women's History Month and commemorating all those who tragically die because of women and girls who die because of male violence as well. So I just want to take a moment to, to put that into perspective as well. So there are always good points and there's always some negativity around this. But um, tonight is uh, not about me. I'm chairing. My name is Jackie Jones. I was a former member of the European Parliament for Wales, very happily for Welsh Labour. And um, I'm now a candidate for the Senate which is the Welsh Parliament seat of Priscilla Pembrokeshire. Welcome, welcome, welcome those who are still joining us. Tonight we have a fantastic lineup of wonderful, powerful, um, brilliant women who are going to be speaking about women's empowerment. And boy, are they empowered and boy, are they powerful. And if you want political will, here you have it. They make change happen. Absolutely delighted to introduce Tulip Siddiq, MP, Joanna Maycock, Dr. Gronya Healy, and the formidable Zita Gome. So we have all four women who are gonna be speaking, not in that order, but in quite a slightly different order. And I'm gonna go straight over and they have about seven minutes to make their um, interventions. And I can't wait to hear all of them uh, speak. Now, um, the first person who I'm going to call um, on is Tulip Sadiq MP, who unfortunately has to leave after the speech because she's doing absolutely important and vital work that she needs to get to. She's Labour's Shadow Minister for Children and Early Years and in 2019 became the first MP to be allowed to vote by proxy in the House of Commons because she was on maternity leave. Cool. Wonderful. Tulip, we met last time at CSW a couple of years ago but it's lovely, lovely to see you. So please do, um, over to you for seven minutes. Thank you so much, Jackie. It's such a pleasure to be on this all women panel. It doesn't always happen in politics. I'm sure a lot of you will be aware, but really lovely to be here today. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak. And should I, I should just give um, Jampi a sh shout out because he's not a woman, but he has, actually supported and encouraged me for so many years that I feel like he deserves a mention today when we're talking about EU and women's rights. I find it genuinely hard to list the number of reasons why I opposed Brexit. I do represent Hampstead and Kilburn where 76% of my constituents voted to remain in the EU. I also represent 30,000 EU nationals, one of the highest in the country in my constituency. It doesn't matter if they can vote or not vote for me, they're my constituents. And at every opportunity, I've tried to stand up for their rights in Parliament. But not only are there the real economic consequences we're facing, including the immediate 40% hit we saw to European exports and the masses of red tape that exporting British businesses are facing for no benefit, but it's fundamentally a step in the wrong direction for Britain's place in the world which I firmly believe should be outward facing, internationalist and based on cooperation with our neighbors. But I think just as important as all of those things are the rights we've lost as a result of leaving the EU, the rights that could have been chipped away at it in the years to come. So already there's a hemorrhaging of rights when it comes to opportunities that young people have to live, work and study in Europe and the rights that working artists and musicians have benefited for for years and years, which will now be severely curtailed. There are also rights that were once guaranteed by our membership of the EU that are now sadly at the mercy of this government. We've seen the policing bill this week that this government is prepared to attack our most basic rights, like the right to protest. You saw that we tried from the Labour Party to oppose it, but we don't have a majority. And for all the promises the government made about protecting workers' rights, environmental rights, at the first pressure from the right wing of their party, they are prepared to tear that all up, which is shameful. And women's rights is one of the areas that I'm most concerned about. Indeed, one of the reasons why I campaigned so hard to stop Brexit alongside 
many of you on this call because of the damage it would do to women, both economically and also in terms of their rights. I was one of the few that voted against triggering Article 50 in Parliament, and I'm very proud I did that, and I don't regret it for a second. The EU law has been the basis of so many women's rights in this country for many decades, and our membership of the EU has guided progress towards gender equality in the UK at key moments, whether that from protections for women facing domestic abuse or equal pain. And far too often, our government in Westminster has had to be dragged, kicking and screaming to accept improved rights for women and others. And that's been especially true under this conservative government. And in the past, as I'm sure all of you are aware, it's often taken the European Court of Justice to enforce our obligation under EU law for our government to adhere to the basic rights and rules that we as a country have agreed to. And I'm extremely worried now that without that safeguard, the government will either by self incompetence or outright defiance start to ch chip away at these rights or try to scrap them entirely, affecting an entire generation of women. Now that we have left the EU and the transition period, many of the safeguards for these fundamental rights have gone. Key legal protections amongst human trafficking and rights like the entitlement to equal pay for equal work are no longer guaranteed by the direct effect of EU law and the enforcement powers of the EJC. The same goes for rights around health and safety, paid leave for antenatal appointments and maternity, dismissal during pregnancy, and much else besides. And we know all of these things disproportionately hit women. We've also been decoupled from the progress that the EU has made and is continuing to make on women's equality, excluded from EU initiatives around unpaid care work, parental leave and violence against women and girls that we could have benefited from as a member of the EU. And I'm sure a lot of you today and this week have been thinking about violence against women and girls for very obvious reasons. And I think I speak for all of us when I say that our thoughts today are with Sarah Everett's family. So our fundamental rights are now exposed to a conservative government with a track record of undermining them. And we're no longer united with other countries on the path to progress. I know I sound negative, but I very much hope that we do not see progress on gender equality stalled or reversed as a result of this. But we have a job. Everyone in this call knows this. We have a job to make sure that that doesn't happen. And it starts with opposing legislation like the policing bill, which threatens fundamental rights and making people aware of the damage this government is doing. But we may also have to start making the positive case for our legal protections and progress towards equality. And I'll be right beside you, alongside you, while we do this. And I'm sure the fabulous speakers that we have lined up on this call today, a powerhouse of women will be championing in their own ways the rights to make sure that we safeguard and protect women along the way. Like a true politician, I'm going to try not to go over my time, Jackie. So I'll hand back to you. I think I hit seven minutes there. Wonderful. I Thank you so much. Jackie. If you don't mind, I'm just going to say why I'm leaving early. I think it's important to say the reason yes. why I'm leaving early. A lot of you will be aware that my constituent, Nazanin Zaghari Radcliffe, is, uh, has been in prison for a crime that she didn't commit, a pawn pod between two countries. Most of the decision making, to be fair, have been made by men which are affecting her life. So she's now been um, faced, she's going to face another charge and she'll find out the verdict on Sunday. And I have a meeting actually in half an hour to meet with some people to see what we can do for her if the verdict turns out to be what we don't want. So I won't give away too much, but I'm very grateful for all of you because lots of you have been joining the campaign. You've written to your own MPs and it's because of this pressure that we've come so far. So thank you. I know this is, meeting isn't about Nazneen, but I thought I would mention it because it's taken up a significant time of mine while I've been an MP and it's really important that we keep the pressure up. So thank you for your support as well on that campaign. Thank you so much, Drew. really important. Thank you for taking that campaign so far and keeping up the pressure. And um, we, we mustn't forget who 
uh, is partly to blame for her being in such a difficult position as well. And he happens to be prime minister at the moment. So I'll never forgive him for that either for many, many different things. So thank you very much for your speech it was actually six minutes long. So that's wonderful, <laughs> fantastic as a chair. Um, I just want to um, also thank you very much for all the, um, all that you do, because I know that it's really difficult in parliament at the moment, and especially being pro-European it hasn't always been easy. Um, so the, the more pro-European MPs that we have and who speak up for women's rights, of course, as well, uh, the better as far as I'm concerned. So thank you so much for, for being with us tonight. Brilliant. <clears throat> what a fantastic start. What a fantastic start. So um, if I may move on now to um, Dr. Gronja Healy, who's the co-director of Yes Equality. And that, um, uh, organization successfully campaigned for a yes vote in the Republic of Ireland's 2015 referendum on legalizing um, gay and lesbian marriages. So I'm absolutely delighted to, to um, give you the floor. And I'd really like to know the secret of your success. Powerful women affecting change, just like Tulip and all the rest of you. Thank you. Seven Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to LME for the invitation to be with you this evening and a very happy St. Patrick's Day to you all, um, our national holiday. Such a pleasure to be with you as we examine in Women's History Month, the Women's Agenda and the EU. I've been asked to speak specifically about the role women played in winning the 2015 marriage equality referendum here in Ireland, and I'll do that presently. But I want to begin my remarks by laying out some immediate and I think really outstanding challenges that we face as women. Back in 1951, Sylvia Plath spoke of some of her fundamental ambitions as a woman. I want to be able, she said, to sleep in an open field, to travel west and to walk freely at night. 70 years later, and this fundamental ambition to simply live lives free from fear, free of violence, continues to elude us. Male violence continues to be a blight on all efforts to achieve gender equality. And recent events in the UK with the murder of Sarah Everard and the reaction of women everywhere to that heinous crime reminds us all that our fight to take back the night is still not won. Just this week here in Ireland, we had a court case where a 69-year-old woman out walking at 7.30 in the morning was bundled into the boot of a car and escaped only because she was fit enough to put up a fight. Yes, they caught the perpetrator, but that woman and those of us who walk past where she was attacked, we will never forget it. Another layer of fear to rest upon the multitude of layers we all as women gather from childhood to old age. We must join in the call to action now to end violence against women if we are ever to achieve gender equality. It is our greatest foe. A Citizens' Assembly on Gender Equality has been meeting in Ireland for just over a year now, examining issues of care, the gender pay gap, public representation, workplace barriers, and just last weekend we discussed domestic sexual and gender-based violence. This violence in its many forms, whether in our homes, on the streets, or even just in our conscious minds every day as something we fear, is perhaps one of the keenest indicators of and barriers to the achievement of gender equality. The Assembly will be making its recommendation uh, to government by the summer. The COVID-19 pandemic has led to what has been termed a shadow pandemic of domestic sexual and gender-based violence in the last year. The UN told us yesterday that it is escalating, not abating. Gathering the voices, the intent and the actions of all men, including those in the LME and the wider EU and globally, is the only way to end violence and the threat of it. And I believe this must be top of the agenda as we remember Women's History Month and push for success for the so-called women's agenda. Discussions on consent, education, and also dealing with perpetrators for the protection of women brings benefits for all of us as women, allows us to take public spaces without fear, take our rightful places in the workforce, the parliament, the boardroom, and live peacefully in our homes and families. But it is also for our sons, our daughters, and wider society. And so on to my central contribution this evening. 
The winning of the marriage equality referendum in 2015 began when two women, Catherine Zapone and Anne Louise Gilligan, lifelong partners who had founded a women's education space from their home in West Dublin in the 1970s. They returned from having been married in Canada in 2003 and they invited a few friends to sit at their dinner table and they shared their plans to take a court case to have their same-sex marriage recognised in Ireland. The case ultimately failed in the courts, but that dinner party was the spark that set off the marriage equality movement in Ireland. The road to building a campaign over more than a decade took much thinking and strategising, and when three of us from around that dinner table formed marriage equality and I became chairwoman, we were long-standing feminist friends who had fought earlier campaigns for women's rights, contraception, abortion and the wider gender equality. We were in marriage equality, mostly women, some with children in same-sex headed families where there was no recognition for our families, given that only the married family had constitutional protection in Ireland. Our families were at best invisible, at worst without protection and lacking legal rights between children and parents. The marriage equality campaign spent a decade raising awareness amongst the public, gaining traction with politicians politicians that this was indeed a matter of fundamental rights to be able to marry the person you love. We ran a values-based campaign. In the early days, yes, we needed to make arguments about the failure of the state to protect us, the unfairness of the exclusion, the pain of relationships, which meant we were not allowed to belong. But when we got the movement up and running by traveling across Ireland, speaking to local community leaders, mostly women, using our feminist networks and track records to win a hearing amongst women and men, we found ourselves in another citizens assembly in 2013. This gathering discussed marriage equality and recommended to the government by 79% that the government should put the issue to the people in a referendum which if it was won would insert the right to marry regardless of sex into the Irish constitution. For us in marriage equality this was a game changer we knew because we have a fondness well more of a habit of holding referenda in Ireland. We often said to supporters do you want to win an, an argument or do you want to win a referendum? Because the strategies needed to win a referendum are entirely different to winning an argument. Gone was the shouting at crowds off the back of a lorry. Gone was the putting forward men in suits to explain how constitutions worked. Gone was a telling people how to vote approach. In its place, we formed Yes Equality. A week after that historic recommendation from the Citizens' Assembly in 2013, I phoned the leader of Ireland's key LGBT organisation, Brian Sheehan, and we agreed with the Irish Council of Civil Liberties that we would come together and in doing so, try to forget the awful rows about strategy we had had in previous years. They had campaigned for civil partnership. We had wanted full marriage equality. So we ran a civil society campaign called Yes Equality as part partners, Brian and myself as co-directors, leading our staff and followers towards winning a referendum. Instead of the old ways of campaigning, we canvassed on doorsteps, in bus stations and shopping centres, and our opening line was, I'm voting yes in the forthcoming referendum on marriage equality. Can I tell you why? Thus began the national conversation that was to move hearts and minds of a nation to deliver a 63% win in a referendum which I believe surprised the world. No more shouting the odds, we adopted a series of values from the campaign using polling and focus groups to help us. Values which we discovered Irish people aspired to and which if we could demonstrate in our campaign we were convinced people would follow and be attracted to the campaign and our proposition. And most importantly, they would move to vote yes in May 2015. These values were equality, love, generosity, inclusion and fairness. The five values which we espoused, but also which we used as hooks to gather and win followers and yes voters. Values which would determine the tone of the campaign. Gone was any shred of hectoring the electorate or the opposition 
softer, respectful tone, supported by a huge social media offering, allowing younger activists a space to draw in even more supporters. Many of the 70 local Yes Equality Canvas teams who knocked on tens of thousands of doors were women-led. We learned from our polling and focus groups that women across all ages and segments of the population were overwhelmingly more likely to be in favour of marriage equality. We lined up women and champions to speak to them, other women, persons of profile whom they trusted to speak to them and encourage them to vote, to join with us. We matched the messages with the messengers. We also learned that those most likely to move from soft yes to a no vote were men over 45. And again, we marshaled other men over 45 to speak to this segment, sportsmen, public figures, rugby players, fathers of gay sons to speak to this set of voters to ease their fears and bring them around to vote. Finally, on the day of the count, I was in the RTE studios at a quarter to nine, waiting to go on to be part of the coverage which the national broadcasting station was running all day. Shortly after nine o'clock, the first of the ballot boxes were opened. We heard the opposition had conceded. We had won, and yet not a paper formally counted. The tally men and the tally women across the country could see the patterns from the tumbling papers. It took till six o'clock to get a final result of a 63% yes vote. The first person I called was Catherine Zapone to thank her and Anne Louise for being the sparks and the inspiration for the marriage equality movement. And we celebrated that a small group of women had worked together for over a decade and with our allies, we'd finally had a great victory using values-based campaigning strategy. A great day for Ireland, a great day for marriage equality globally, and a great day for the men and women of the Yes Equality referendum campaign, at the core of which was Catherine and Anne Louise, our Sparks, and a handful of other sister campaigning stalwarts. As Margaret Mead reminds us, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you. Oh, marvellous. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. That's absolutely brilliant. And uh, values-based campaigning, how wonderful that would be right now. How wonderful in the UK. Um, I'm not sure how far I'll go at the moment, but um, absolutely brilliant. And, and just to remind everyone, if you wanted to ask questions, you uh, raise your hand and um, you can put some questions in, in the chat already if you prefer. But I'm absolutely delighted now to give Joanna Maycock, General Secretary of the European Women's Lobby, the largest umbrella organization of women's associations in the European Union, the floor. She's an absolutely formidable woman and a mover and shaker and has been, monu uh, has been instrumental in so many positive changes for women. So Joanna, seven minutes. Thank you very much, Jackie. Thanks to LME and thanks to all the other speakers tonight for their incredible and inspiring words. Um, really, really moving, I, I think. So uh, Jackie already said the European Women's Lobby is a, is a vast umbrella of women's associations and organisations co coming together to campaign for a, our vision of a, of a feminist Europe. And the European Women's Lobby has been around for just over 30 years. I just wanted to say that um, the British women's organisations, so women's organisations from the UK, were instrumental in founding the European Women's Lobby recognizing the need to, for, to create a strong and powerful voice for women at the EU level, as the EU was developing legislation and measures, building social Europe in the, in the 90s. Um, and today, this, in spite of the, the tragedy of Brexit, we have done everything we in our power as the European Women's Lobby to ensure that British women's organizations retain a voice and a full seat as, as full members of the European Women's Lobby. It was really important to all of our members across the EU that British women uh, remained inside the European Women's Lobby, uh, connected to women campaigning across Europe, sharing experiences, sisterhood and solidarity. I want to also shout out to a number of other women who I've spotted in the participants list who've been instrumental in, in the work that we've done because the, the, the impact that the European uh, Women's Lobby, the, uh, the members that we have across Europe has had has been in part through, through partnership, through um, engagement, sometimes heated disagreement to find a way pass forward, 
with women uh, and other allies working across the European Parliament, the European Commission and other parts of civil society. So I, I see my pre predecessor, Mary McPhail, a previous Secretary General of the European Women's Lobby, hiding away in the participants, uh, but also Belinda Pike, who was a really important supporter of the European Women's Lobby during her time working in the European Commission. And of course, Jackie, um, I think so many of the, the, um, the pieces of work that we've done and the impact that we've had at European level have been down to women in the European Parliament and so many uh, British Labour MEP women over the years who we've worked with and partnered with, uh, such as yourself. And it was such a, a, such a, such a sad day for all of us when we, we had to say goodbye to all of you from the European Parliament. I think Tulip said really, uh, really articulated well um, the rights that Europe has enshrined for women. In fact, equal pay for work of equal value was part of the Treaty of Rome in 1957. What a shame we have still haven't achieved it. But just this, uh, just in the last couple of few weeks, the European Commission has has proposed and put forward a, a European directive on pay transparency, and um, something we really welcome as a first step in really trying to put an end to the discrimination, the pay discrimination that, that women face to, to this day in Europe. But also Europe has been instrumental with, with pressure from women's organizations in putting forward anti-discrimination legislation, legislation for protection for pregnant workers, maternity leave, parental leave, um, uh, also legislation to put an end to sexual harassment in the workplace. Uh, trafficking and sexual exploitation, you know, in all areas really of, of women's lives. And I think the important thing also is that space for learning and sharing, negotiating and advancing together so that all women and girls in Europe can enjoy full equality. Um, I wanted, I was asked to say a little bit about the current uh, agenda and what, what's happening right now. Uh, I think I still got a couple of minutes, Jackie, right? So, um, we know because we because one thing Europe's good at is collecting data and statistics, and we have a really excellent uh, a European agency called the European Institute for Gender Equality that sits in Vilnius and collects uh, data and statistics on gender equality. Uh, so we have like a really solid base of sex disaggregated data, which tells us that we've actually stopped progressing on equality between women and men for the last decade. Progress has been so small that you can't even see it. And actually the UK has gone backwards when, it, when we look at the gender equality index. And what we've seen is that COVID is only making things worse. We've heard from our members across Europe, testimony of the devastating impact of COVID on women and girls. While on the one hand, women are making up the vast majority of those working at the front lines, especially in low paid and precarious work in the care sector and in the health sector, at the same time, women are experiencing increased poverty, unemployment and precarity. Uh, women are experiencing an even greater uneven burden of care work, unpaid care work in the home that seems to be sending us back to the 1950s or at least drawing back a curtain on the depth of inequality that continues to exist in our workplaces, in our households. And we've seen a spike in violence against women and girls online, in the home, in the street, a devastating spike in violence against women and girls. I couldn't say it more eloquently than, than Gronia. Until we recognize and deal with and uproot the, the structural continuum of male violence against women and girls, we will never ever achieve full equality. And so what's happening now, for us it's really important that we don't see the recovery from COVID um, just through the lens of trying to stop inequality from getting worse. That is just not good enough. We have to seize an opportunity now to, to bring about transformational change in our economies and our societies that really recognizes and values the contribution that women make, that puts women's voices at the heart of decision making about the, the future that we want to build. We've seen um, the European Union recently has approved some 750 billion euros of recovery funds. These are grants and loans to be distributed by EU member states. Um, and we have uh, managed with again with allies throughout the institutions and member states to put language in that in those recovery funds which requires uh, national governments to look at the disproportional impact on women and men of the investments that they're proposing. We're saying that has to be um, what we're looking at now is really a, a new economy that puts care 
at the center and not the margins of our economy and our society. Women are the backbone of our societies and care is not an afterthought. It's central to everything that we do, care for ourselves, care for each other and care for the planet. It's time to make, to, to make a bold new care deal for Europe a reality. And we can do that through careful use of, our, of those recovery funds. We're also looking ahead, something that we at the European Lo Women's Lobby have been fighting for, for uh, Mary can uh, certainly uh, confirm this, at least 20 years, which is an EU directive on violence against women. Finally, the European Commission is genuinely looking into how we can have an EU-wide directive that looks at all forms of violence and male violence against women and girls, including sexual exploitation, online violence, strengthened measures to address uh, misogyny and uh, sexual harassment and, and sexual violence. This is now on the, on the cards and we're working together with our members across Europe, with the European Parliament and with others in civil society to make that a reality. And we'll continue to work with our sisters in the UK so they remain informed and engaged in what's happening in Europe so that can act as an, insp an inspiration to one another in advancing uh, women's equality for the 21st century. Thank you. Brilliant, Joanna. Thank you so much for that. And it, it just demonstrates a little bit, just a tiny bit of what we're, go what we're missing <clears throat> and what we're missing out on uh, in the UK going forward. We're going backwards. The EU is stepping forward and stepping up. And I'm sure Zita will talk, so I won't say very much about Commissioner Dali and all of the fantastic MEPs who, uh, from the S&D in particular, who are stepping up and stepping forward and um, speaking out and, and not just words, it's actions as well. So thank you so much, Joanna, for that um, um, wonderful speech. Keeping to eight minutes is wonderful. <laughs> now, I've got to say something very special about Zita. When I first got to the European Parliament, this woman met me in the Mickey Mouse Cafe some of you uh, know that. And she was like, wow, a force of nature. It was like a tsunami came towards me of power and influence and just goodwill and good wishes to, to succeed. And a lovely little fan that she gave me as well. And I've kept that very safe. It's in a drawer, it's very safe. And I absolutely love this woman because um, she has so many roles and is in all of the major rooms where uh, decisions are made. So Zita Gome is president of the party of the European Socialist Women, so PES Women, vice president of the Foundation of the European Progressive Studies, think tank, MP for the Hungarian Parliament. But you're much more than that. You also have roles in the Council of Europe and deal with violence against, ending violence against women as well and other things as well that is a long list. So Zita, thank you very much for your wonderfulness. Please, you have the floor for seven minutes. Yes, yes, thank you very much. So first of all, uh, I think it's absolutely rare when you are in the virtuous sphere, uh, people who you have a special place in my heart. Actually 18 years ago, when I became an observer to the European Parliament, I never forget the reception uh, organized or hosted by uh, the European Women's Lobby Whose who Secretary General uh, has been Mary McPhail. So actually, uh, my first step, uh, 2003, actually, I got a very strong support as a young uh, uh, Central Eastern European feminist. And I would say that she, she was there from, from the beginning. And of course, uh, on, of course later on, uh, when, uh, when uh, uh, I, uh, of course, had the chance to meet uh, uh, Jumpy, uh, everybody knows Jumpy, so it's no, no passion. Uh, and actually, I can tell you that the reason why I have a good flat in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Brussels is because he was the best bargainer ever. So anyway, so anything happens, I know that he's always in my, in my brain. And, and of course, he asked me, Tita, you need to come and be part of uh, Solidar and the Silver Rose Jury is still working on. And I believe that your idea, which you built up with Glenis Kinnock, and if I would like to tell how amazing uh, this woman has been and the work uh, in the parliament uh, from ACP uh, to, to the labor, of course, uh, I would say that really, I really respect that. Let's, uh, let's talk about the, the, the topic, which is pretty, uh, pretty uh, difficult. And of course, I'm really happy to have so many amazing uh, a friend around, Britta Thompson is also here, she was a great feminist friend uh, from mine from, uh, from uh, Denmark. 
And of course, he's also uh, one of my mentees in, uh, in, in my life. But of course, the fight for women's rights in Europe and uh, what uh, VPS women are doing to promote a progressive uh, feminist agenda, uh, I think this is an ongoing work from, 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 from morning to, to late night. And this is mobilizing from the morning uh, till, till late night. And of course, uh, uh, how can you do that? You need great uh, allies like, like Jackie Jones, whom I could cry that she had to leave the parliament. And I'm more British than ever when idiots found out that Britain has to leave. And this is a shame that, uh, that young labor could not get the real taste. But uh, what does it mean to be a member of uh, European Union and what to be, be in a club you know, of values? Uh, let's, uh, let's put it in this way. And, and of course, uh, Joanna, of course, uh, Joanna is my great uh, friend and I miss uh, the dinners and lunch because, uh, you know, this COVID is really killing the personal touch, uh, but I am sure that we, we, will, we will continue to, to work together. But we, we had a lot of common activity beside the fact that we are not, uh, we cannot see each other. So concerning PS women, just a short intro. Uh, PS Women is an organization of the Party of European Socialists, an umbrella organization with social democratic and labor uh, parties active since the 1990s. And we have 30 women organizations belonging to PS member parties in Europe, both inside and outside the European Union. And I can tell you, I'm going to work pretty hard to make sure that in the next PS Women Executive, uh, a labor woman is going to be there because I believe it's absolutely crucial that we, we, we think together. It does not matter uh, whether, your, uh, whether your country is not a member right now uh, of the European Union. And of course, what is our main task to promote gender equality and the women representation both inside and outside of the party? And of course, we bring together PS ministers for gender equality on a regular basis ahead of the council meetings. And we organize PES gender equality network to exchange with the civil society and progressive partners. So we just have been together with, with Joanna, but of course with ETUC, with Solidar and with other uh, organizations that, uh, that uh, we, we work together. And of course, we have a very clear uh, political goal ensuring intersectional gender equality and economic and uh, political decision-making. Uh, Joanna mentioned ending the gender-based violence and protecting all rights for women, including sexual and reproductive health and rights, which is in a huge in danger. And I don't want to talk about what's going on in Poland and what's going on in, in Hungary. Of course, ending a, a gender stereotype and of course, establishing a feminist economy for Europe, which closes the gender gaps such as gender pay and employment gaps and that puts well-being at the center uh, and up values women's economic contribution, especially uh, regarding car work. I'm very thankful that you, know, you mentioned uh, the Commissioner for Equality, Helena Dali, who is a Maltese labor, by the way. I was fighting with, the, with the, the former prime minister of Malta and I told that we need her to be the, the commissioner on equality. And she, she said, but Sita, but she's my best minister. And I said, yes, that's why we need to be the best commissioner for equality. And Helena became the commissioner. And this is really a common fight with the European women's lobby because we were the only party from 2004 who really wanted to get a commissioner who deals only with equality, which is absolutely a huge uh, issue. And of course, uh, PS Women is highly engaged in advocacy, awareness raising and campaigning uh, towards our own parties, member states, governments and EU institutions, both by engaging with ongoing legislative files and by raising new progressive uh, policy ideas. And of course, when the COVID-19 uh, crisis started, we have been the first to write a very clear letter for, uh, for Ursula von der Leyen, who is not a feminist, far away from feminist, and her, her promises are empty words, but we really need to fight to make sure that she understands that it's not enough to be a woman. She needs to be a feminist woman if she wants to change uh, uh, Europe. And for PS women, of course, it's, it is very important to give a platform to women's voices and to keep 
highlighting the challenges faced by women in Europe. Maybe it be through networking, conferences, awareness raising, or or uh, campaigning. Pest Women has a has a tiny secretariat with uh, with Katya, Louise, and uh, and Frida, who are doing an amazing job and doing all the preparation uh, for the CSW sixty five, which is which is this uh, which is this week, and of course. Uh, and these challenges are many, especially during COVID and, uh, and the grand you already uh, mentioned. We just celebrated the International Women's Day, a day which socialist and social democratic women have been marking for over 100 years. But as we have seen this last year, gender inequality is still a sad reality and decades of progress are at high risk of being erased unless Europe collectively builds back better in a feminist progressive way, no other way for European, I can tell you. All over Europe, we have been disproportionately hit by the pandemic, gender-based violence in the home and online has increased. Women have suffered the bigger job losses and have borne uh, the biggest burden as unpaid frontline workers and unpaid care workers uh, in, in the home. And at the same time, there is a, a huge conservative backlash in Europe with government like my own government, Hungary and Poland curtailing abortion and LGBT rights and refusing to even use them. The word gender equality in Hungary, you cannot use the word ge gender is danger. The gender is not woman and man. It's everybody can be gender. So that's absolutely unacceptable the way uh, that uh, the Hungarian uh, government uh, behaves. But, but thanks to progressive, uh, I believe that we are moving forward for many years. PS women fought to have a commissioner and I believe that Helena uh, built an ally with, with, with all the other socialist uh, commissioners and we have the most women commissioners ever. That is, a, that is again a common fight with, uh, with, uh, with the European women's lobby and with, with other uh, civil society. Uh, members and of course Helena is uh, is doing a good job pushing to implement the EU gender equality strategy in which PS women uh, support her together with our progressive ministers and colleagues in the European Parliament and I can tell you and, and Jackie knows very well that we have so many amazing feminist uh, sisters in 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 the European uh, Parliament as my friend uh, Britta Thompson who who has been also a member of the PS Women Executive. And thanks to feminists, to our progressive family that even have a gender equality strategy and a European pillar of social rights. Without the effort of our MEPs and ministers, there would be no EU work-life balance directive, no minimum wage and pay transparency proposals, uh, Joanna just mentioned, no attempt to unblock the Women Boards Directive, and no joint effort to ratify the Istanbul Convention on Gender-Based Violence into EU law. And as Jackie mentioned, uh, I have been the rapporteur on the Istanbul Convention in the Council of Europe, but now I am the general rapporteur on violence against women within, and I'm chairing the network Free for Violence. So that's uh, in, uh, but I'm dealing always with women and gender, so nothing else. That's 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 really my life. Uh, but of course, uh, we are continuing to fight uh, fight on all these fronts. Right now, our focus is on making sure that the pay transparency directive becomes law, and to make sure that all EU member states implement the gender just COVID recovery and the resilience plan. A PS Women just last week published a feminist checklist to hold governments accountable on this. And we also sent it to the commission and president. I hope that she's going to read it. I think it's very clear. We are helping because we really want to make it uh, happen. And we are also working to achieve a more long-term change in Europe by pushing for a feminist economy for Europe. A few months ago, PS Women published a brochure which set out our vision for a new progressive economic system which properly values women's economic contribution to society, which invests in care and welfare, because these are the basic, which involves women in decision-making and which invests in the social infrastructure required for women to become economically independent. So this is an ongoing project uh, for us. And of course, to implement our priorities and to strengthen our political family when it comes to gender equality, we are not only preparing regular briefings, but we are also 
regularly organizing workshops together with our progressive partners, such as uh, the European Women's Lobby, Foundation for European Progressive Studies, the Young European Socialist, Rainbow Rose, uh, just to name a few, and of course, Solidar. We also host training for our members to give them the necessary tools to bring inspiration and, uh, and I would say new aspect into their parties or, or, or national level. Also every year we carry out uh, creative campaigns for both equal and unequal pay day to make policymakers more aware of the gender pay and pension gap and to push for a change. But we have also created awareness raising campaigns in other areas such as for unblocking the women uh, on board directive or for establishing a formal platform for gender equality ministers at the council level. This year we organized a big campaign for Europe Equal Pay Day and International Women's Day called hashtag make her count. It features video messages from uh, women frontline workers, from ministers, mm, commissioners. Uh, that is a very supportive message from our progressive family, highlighting that women are doing the maximum amount of work for minimum pay and uh, <clears throat> recognition. So if you are interested in learning more, of course, uh, uh, I suggest you to, to, to check our website, Twitter, Facebook, and sign up. We have, a, we have a newsletter. Of course, I'm happy to get the news from you. So thanks again. And I will send you a little hard because the law story <laughs> that the first party in, uh, in Europe who give a helping hand for my party, uh, that was the, the British Labour. So that means that British Labour has a very special place in my heart and in my life. And actually, I never saw that was 18 years ago when I met uh, Mary, and, uh, Mary and, uh, and, and Jumpy. So I can tell you, I grown up, I really did what I could with the bottom of my heart to make feminism a reality in Europe. So thank you very, very much. Oh, wonderful, Zita. Thank you so much. 18 years, that's five minutes ago, right? Yeah, yes. <laughs> so, fantastic, lovely, thank you. And look what we're missing out on, not being part of the EU, not being, but we're still part of the Council of Europe. And that, that's the good news for now, for now. And we have to fight to retain that, of course. I just want meant to point out to Gronia, I don't know if you noticed or not, but the European Court of Justice um, had its first court um, judgment that is fully in Irish that was published today as well. I just wanted to mention that on St. Patrick's Day as well. Thank you Thank so you. much, Zita. Thank you everyone for that, for all of those. Um, while you're thinking of um, questions for the panelists, short questions, please, if possible, so that we can get to snappy answers if we can. Um, I just want to um, mention that you, all of you, if you're not already, can join Labour Movement for Europe. You can do that. It's absolutely wonderful. And uh, it is the only pro-EU society affiliated to the Labour Party. Isn't that wonderful? That's absolutely great, isn't it? Yay. So all of you within five minutes can get online and Harry's going to put in the chat the links and stuff that you can just um, sign up for it. You can also sign up for emails and uh, newsletters, and you can donate as well. That are, every little bit counts, right? Everything counts. So make it count, guys. So if, um, there might be some questions in the chat, but I've got uh, a question while you're thinking about that as well. Um, and I wanted to ask the three panelists this, and it's an unfair question, but I know that you can handle it, no problem at all. What would your top three asks be? of politicians or anything that you can change? What would be three things, the top three things that you would change? Whether it's in your, because obviously the personal is political in feminist movement, whether it's in, in the surrounding areas of your own life, whether it's in your country or further afield. So who would like to go first? Oh, it's like counter. Dun, 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 dun. Joanna, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, and I've got 30 minutes for this answer, right, Jackie? 
<laughs> no. I also saw a question in the in the chat, which was similarly about how whether we should we need to prioritize ending mm. violence against women and girls, or whether we need to uh, prioritize uh, the feminist economics and economic equality. And I I think, and I think for the European Women's Lobby, it's really clear that it's impossible to to mm. to pull those apart. That actually, if we want to bring about equality for for women uh, and um, between women and men and, and rights for women and girls, we need to really tackle very structural, fundamental pieces of our society and our and our economies, and right from our personal, family, workplace, uh, and and you know political levels. So for me, I would have to bring, uh, th I suppose, three things. You asked me to say. One, we need to have equal representation of women and men in every single place where decisions are being made, except in the women's movement, where we should only have women, of course. Um, but I mean, in parliaments, in councils, in boardrooms, in designing recovery plans for COVID, in trade unions, in political parties, we need to make sure that women are represented equally. Um, you know, we've made progress in the European Parliament by having now, I think it's about 40% women MEPs. That still means that men are massively overrepresented in the European Parliament with 60% of the MEPs. So we've made progress, but it's not far enough. Um, and as I say, that's not just in parliaments. It's, out, it's, it's in position, it's in ministries, it's in police forces. I to talk about something uh, very topical. It's also in courts and justice systems. So we need to have parity. Second thing, is that we need a, for, for so many reasons, we need a transformation of our economy. The current economic system based on growth, GDP and um, production is really failing women and men, it's failing the planet, it's failing all of us. And it's time to really rethink and reimagine an economy where, where care is at the center of the economy, where women's contribution is absolutely valued, whether that's in the home, in the workplace, in society at large, um, you know, so all that comes with that for the in the feminist uh, transformation of the economy, different tax systems, different budgeting systems, different ways of working out what we value as societies. And if this pandemic has shown us something, that surely is it. The time is now for that. Um, and then the third thing, absolutely, we need to have as a whole society to place the ending of male violence against women and girls at the centre of everything we do. We're spending trillions and trillions on useless weapons and militarization. We can't, we're, and yet we're cutting basic spending on, um, on shelters and support for women who are victims and survivors of violence, including those who are exiting prostitution and trafficking. It's absolutely time to turn that on, on its head. Let's take all that money away from military spending and spend it out on, on doing everything we can from education to justice, to, to legislation, to support, um, to really put an end to violence against um, male violence against women and girls. We, we, we know it's possible. We know it's possible. We've had enough. Women, we've had enough. We're angry and we've had enough. And it's time really for, for massive um, investment of political will and resources to put an end to the levels of violence against uh, women and girls that we've been seeing. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. And we, we've uh, seen today, I think it was, that the UK is... Um, um, planning to spend more on nuclear weapons again, um, breaching the uh, non-proliferation uh, treaty as well. So I see a hand up and, and I will note it down, uh, Margarita. I will come to you once I've gone to the other panelists for their top three asks. Is that all right? Yeah. Um, so well, to, would you like to go next? Yeah, I'll, I'll go next. Yeah. And again, Joanna has, has, has said it very eloquently in terms of, of, of choosing, you know, Top three asks. They are all, I think, interconnected. Uh, Monica there asked a question about, you know, should we be going for economic independence or or should we be addressing violence against women? There's absolutely no doubt that, um, you know, economic independence uh, for women is actually unattainable so long as women remain abused at home, unable to uh, have their own income, uh, fearful of going out on the street, going to work, and then in work, harassment that happens in the workplace, preventing women from going forward uh, for positions, uh, and similarly then the wider public positions. I mean, a major issue here, and I know it's, it's similar across Europe, is any elected representative, the online abuse that women are getting, and the numbers of women who are saying, actually, 
I'm not going forward because I don't want my kids seeing the kind of stuff that's been put up about me as a woman. Uh, and, and I think that that's the kind that's really dangerous for democracy uh, that that we have that happening. So I think both have to be addressed. Um, uh, like Joanna, I mean, I think that the feminist analysis of climate action is really important. You know, if we don't save the planet, we're not going to have a place uh, to live. And while people of my age, you know, uh, we'll probably squeak through, but I think of, you know, our sons, my grandson, who's who's only seven, like, w w what are we leaving them as a world? And we have got to take this on and we've got to do it. And I think the feminist analysis of protecting the planet and having a sustainable future. The third one I would say is, is related to the care economy. And I think if COVID has shown us anything, it is the importance of the care economy, the the mostly informal, poorly paid, uh, under-recognised, unvalued. And I think if we could have that as a value to put the care economy and to value it in the way we, we need it, our children need it, uh, 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 older people need it, people with disabilities, all of that is all about what kind of a society do we want to live in? And I think that needs to be transformed and can be by the feminist analysis. So there are three key things I'd, I, I would push for. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Zita. Okay, I try to find uh, our postcard, Power to Women, on which we have a to-do list, you know, and I still believe uh, that we need to we need to recognize, you know, what we already achieved before we go to have further three uh, requests. So women has voting rights and women are on the labor market. So I would say I can repeat what my friend said. Stop violence against women. My mom, my mother, my rights, uh, the sexual rights and reproductive health, equal pay for equal work and uh, and more, uh, more uh, women, uh, we, we need more women leaders. And actually last year uh, we made the gender pay gap, not a game. I don't know how much you see it, it's a card. And then we recognize that we need to change the faces into female faces, you see? Because when you play the card, you, you just have males on. So, you know, we have so many things uh, to do, uh, which, uh, which I, uh, I cannot tell you. But of course, uh, just to be more, more concrete, uh, I would say if we can establish a feminist uh, economy for Europe, uh, which closes the gender pay gaps, such as gender gap, employment gaps, uh, then, uh, the, and I, as, uh, I already told you that, which puts the well being at the center of upper values women's economic contribution, especially regarding care work. And I would say ensuring intersectional gender equality and economic and political decision making. Uh, and uh, I would say ending gender stereotypes. This is something also, but you can, it's very difficult to say three. So actually let's, let's unite, but the violence against women is absolutely uh, an issue, uh, which really showed during the pandemic that uh, that we need to put a special eye. Uh, so I would say line up for action, dear uh, sisters. And of course we need supportive men because this is a common fight. Absolutely, we need allies, definitely. Thank you so much, that's brilliant. Um, Margarita, you've got the floor. Please, if you can be as brief as you can, um, if it's possible then uh, to ask your question. Harry, can you unmute? Yes, that better. Thank you. I would argue that sexist speech must be recognized as hate speech, and it's not at present, and punished as hate speech is. And the other side of that, I would argue that boys and young men must be taught that demeaning women is shameful and shameful to their masculinity. That great charge that their masculinity is so much. They must be taught and made to learn that that is damaging to the whole society and to them also. And I'm sure there are psychologists and others 
can find many, many reasons why that should be so. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was great intervention. I've got Britta on, on, the, uh, on the list as well. If anyone else wants to ask a question, what you can do is look at the participants uh, button and look at the up arrow and put your hand up through that as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to your very um, interesting uh, online meeting here tonight. I'm happy, Sita, that you uh, sent me the link because I think it's so interesting. And uh, I think it's a very, very interesting speeches that covers uh, uh, a lot of areas of uh, women's life and uh, politics. I am a former MEP. I was a member of the European Parliament from Denmark. I am from Copenhagen from 2004 to 2014. And these 10 years, I was a member of the Women's Committee and at the same time, a member of the Energy Committee. And I think I was rapporteur on the first uh, report that starting the greening of Europe, the climate uh, in 2008. And I realized that if we want to make this, take this climate action, we should be aware that 80% of the jobs in the energy sector, in the climate sector, are um, going to be uh, possessed by males. So these well-paid, uh, very good, secure jobs are male jobs. And now we have, the, as Joanna uh, said, the recovery funds. And I would like to tell you that at this time, I invited Oettinger, because Oettinger was a German commissioner for energy, to come to the Women's Committee, where our duty was to mainstream all the directives. And he refused, because I wanted him to tell how could women get in position of these fantastic energy green jobs, because the green jobs today are not for women. Only one place in Europe, they, <coughs> they did one thing, Ireland, the trade union. In Ireland, they went to the energy companies and said, we insist that you promote women and it should be the work of our shop stewards. And there is an excellent example from Ireland on this. So I think they should be used by you in the women's lobby because 37% of the reconstruction funds is going to energy projects. It's going to the greening of the economy. It's full of men, these jobs. 20% are going to uh, digitalization and the digital sector is always also characterized by being male. So we should do an effort to get women into these jobs, otherwise uh, the rec uh, construction fund jobs will be for men, and it's good jobs in these two sectors. So this, Joanna, this is a very important task for the women's lobby. We were so lucky in Denmark on the 8th of March that we had a visit of, uh, of uh, an online meeting of uh, Anna Sophia, your vice chair. So, um, I think you, this, is, this is one of the more uh, important things that we say equal pay. We also want equal jobs. And here in Denmark, uh, we have started making training for women into males jobs, into becoming carpenters, becoming builders, because these jobs in my country are well paid. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for contributing. Absolutely great. <coughs> We've got two hands up um, and then I'll ask, I'll ask these two people to speak and then if the panel wants to respond at that point, please do feel free to. So Tamsin first <coughs> and then Joe, please. Tamsin? Ah, oh, hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I, uh, my name is Tamsin Shasha and um, I am vice chair uh, of Grassroots for Europe. I've uh, just taken over that, just taken on that role. Um, I'm also um, artistic director of a theater company which um, specializes in new translations of ancient Greek comedy and tragedy. And one of the things that we're doing is we're taking a production to COP, I hope 
we're taking a produ production to COP26. So that's a female led production and it's about the environment. So, um, so there are some of us out there, obviously I work in the arts, so it's much more evenly balanced. Um, and um, I'm lucky to be able to say that I have Caroline Lucas as my local MP, so green issues are very important. I just wanted to ask the three panelists how you, you would uh, see how, how you would galvanize uh, younger support uh, amongst, yeah, just amongst the youth really to, because, because when you, when you, this is, this is a, this is a thing that we really have to, um, to come to grips with. And I, I wonder what, what, what things, what each of you, would you say one thing that you could really in, inspire young people to get involved in politics in general, not just about the environment, um, but in, in terms of, um, um, yeah, in terms of what's happening and to do with Brexit or anything really, just how do we right. galvanize young people? Great question. Thank you so much for that. Um, and um, keep the good work up. Joe, please. All right, I'm, I'm also, uh, I'm grassroots for Europe. I'm European movement uh, and the round table, which uh, brings together all sorts of um, campaigning um, pro-Europeans. Um, my question was, um, which of our current media outlets including newspapers, are sympathetic or empathetic towards women's issues, if any. I'm, I'm not sure I could really pinpoint one at all. Thank you very much. It's the mail, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, that was flippant. Obviously not. <laughs> so I'd like to go first. Um, Zita, would you like to go first this time? Is that all right? Sure. OK. <sighs> I would say young people, uh, uh, it's, it's pretty difficult nowadays to find young people because everybody lives in his or her bubble, uh, I would say. So that's why, uh, you know, when, uh, when, uh, when there is no COVID, uh, then of course um, uh, there are several, you know, clubs that you can invite people and, and young people and to ask uh, how they feel. Because I would say uh, the basic question is that uh, that uh, you know we had uh, we had uh, uh, this uh, huge youth unemployment, and uh, we organized a big conference, uh, and 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 they explained us we need a job now, not tomorrow, because we need to we need to live, we need to survive. So I would say uh, the the time uh, is changing so quickly. And uh, you know, jobs who has been good jobs for yesterday are not a good job anymore. So that's why I think it's it's very important to 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 start to have a type of generational dialogue. I can tell you what I do, because when uh, uh, 2004 I was elected the uh, PS Women President. Of course, uh, we 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 really wanted to get, uh, of course, a diverse uh, executive, uh, but. Of course, we, we really wanted to bring the young people on the board. So it means that the, yes, that was called ECOC at that time, the youth organization of the European Socialist Party. So we asked the, the secretary general, if you have any feminist network, we really would like to offer one space for, uh, uh, for uh, one young uh, feminist. And, uh, and since that time, uh, we work together hand in hand. And this is the same, with uh, with uh, with Rainbow Rose, this is the same with uh, our foundation. This is the same with the uh, Committee of Regions. Because I would say that if you really would like to get uh, uh, the opinion of of the different uh, personalities who who has different backgrounds, I think this is really the best uh, the the best way to do that. So the problem is now um, that um, as the technology. Uh, uh, is so well developed and uh, and we have a very little knowledge to compare this young generation and and of course when they when you try to ask and that's the case even with my son you know that uh, to 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 get some help you know it is like in a different world so i think that we need to find uh, you know how can we how can we be still connected because uh, i would say that uh, if you would like to get a proper uh, pension, 
Of course, we need to take care of, of, uh, of the old generation now, but this is the same. The young people should feel a type of responsibility. And of course, uh, uh, this is what you cannot uh, get through, through the internet. This is why you need a uh, personal uh, relationship. And, uh, and I would say with this awful, in a way, awful modern technology, we, we really lost the personal touch. And now this COVID still is not helping uh, in, uh, in this. So that's why I think it's really important uh, when, when you have young people around you, you know, just to sit with them and, and ask them how they feel. Because honestly, we, we, we are not caring enough with them. And, uh, and you can imagine the young people who, who, who just learned what is COVID, you know? Uh, our, the old generation had, had the, the war, you know, they had awful experience, but this COVID is a real shock on the young generation. So we might think, how could we help these young people to, to survive? And of course, we women are great survivors. So probably we should, we should also think about, you know, how to help in a way for, for, for young people. But because I believe that if you really would like to, to build a different uh, uh, future, then we need to talk to them. So I think that we need the generational dialogue uh, more than ever. So this is actually what we discussed uh, today at the CSW 65, how important is, uh, uh, is that type of uh, 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 discussion. And I definitely agree, uh, uh, as you mentioned, the environment, that, uh, that uh, the, 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 the price that we pay for COVID-19, because we did not care. And I think it would be really high time to, to, to think how can we live differently because we interfered into the animal sphere. And, and, and then of course, the, the, this virus is thanks for uh, interfering in a way. So that's why I think we really need to change habits and we really need to find out how can we, how can we live uh, completely differently. And I don't think that people are, are there. Very few people started to think that we need to change our mentality and we have to remind ourselves that we just borrowed the globe from our grandchildren. Thank you. That's an apt reminder as well. Who would like to go next? Yeah, just maybe to, to respond to a couple of the points that were made. I, I completely agree around the sexist speech and the harm it does and, and having it defined as hate speech. And in Ireland, we have some hate crime legislation that's currently being put together. And we're hoping to have the inclusion of hate speech, sexist speech in particular, included uh, in that and to have it dealt with, uh, particularly the online uh, stuff that happens. The other issue I think around, and we've talked a lot about gender-based violence, you know, I think the point about boys being taught um, what is demeaning, that it is demeaning to them, it's demeaning to women. The other thing is the wider issue of violence. I mean, you know, the rest of the violence that is perpetrated against other men is also by men. So, so this is something, it's not just, you know, our women's issue. Uh, the truth is that our hospitals, our emergency departments, every Friday and Saturday night are full of other men who've been beaten up by other men. So, so this is, it's, it's, it's a huge issue. And I think it is about them realizing um, changes in behavior uh, have to happen. Uh, and, and that of course is a, is a longer term but it's got to happen uh, much faster than than it is particularly when we see that that this is actually something on the rise the the issue of younger people i have to say i am really enthusiastic and enthused by the level of activity and activism i see amongst younger people younger women i am couldn't be happier with them they're enthusiastic they're excited they're act they're doing it they're doing it a bit different than we did they're not so happy to sit in dusty l rooms talking to each other the way we maybe cut our teeth uh, on feminist consciousness raising. They're doing it differently. But I believe, as with us, where, you know, the personal was political, it is exactly the same for them. The issues that are burning in their hearts are the issues that they're getting active on. And sometimes, you know, sometimes we need to get out of their way. 
And I say that with respect, but I do think we have to, you know, allow the younger people find their own way. We can support and help in analysis. We can uh, support in terms of resources. But I do think, I mean, we saw after the marriage equality referendum, the number of young people who were involved in that campaign actually went on to be the, the, the first four and five hundred members of what became a new political party in Ireland, the Social Democratic Party. Similarly, after the repeal of the Eighth Amendment campaign on abortion, we saw that many of the new councillors that were subsequently elected and some of our elected parliamentarians had been involved in that campaign. So the issues that they are passionate about are the issues that, that they are becoming active on. And I think that, you know, Let's move out of their way and, and, and bring them on. Quite right. And uh, I'll never forget being in Ireland and, see, uh, and seeing all the, the videos being posted by young women from Ireland coming back to Ireland to be able to vote in the referendum on abortion. That was absolutely so powerful an image to me, how to organise. I see you, Brenda, but I'm going to come to Joanna next. And Brenda will be the last question, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, I've got a few comments that I wanted to make. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I really wanted to build on what, what Gronio was just saying. I think uh, young women are incredibly active and engaged politically uh, on the issues that they are concerned about individually and in and different groups of, of society, whether it's around um, the issues of misogynist hate speech, uh, the impact of pornography, the concerns about sexual harassment, online violence, but also the issues of, uh, of jobs, the lack of them, and the, the kind of economic, um, the dire economic situation that many young women find themselves in uh, as a result of crippling student loans, uh, impossible housing costs, poor, really poor labour market uh, opportunities. I think I see young women really actively engaged on, on all of those things. And we've seen really young women and girls at the leadership of the climate action in, in Europe as well, really leading massive movements of school children. And that just fills my heart with joy. And I completely agree with Gronia that I think for any political movement, uh, if you're really interested in um, supporting the, the voice and the leadership of young people, part of that is listening to them listening to their concerns and getting out of the way. I think all too often um, young people find the pre-existing structures and power structures within our, within our movements uh, stifling or inaccessible. And I think finding new and creative ways to bring, um, to bring in, in our instance young women together is really, really important. We've worked to build a, a kind of annual campaigning uh, feminist boot camp that brings young women from across Europe together to spend four or five days together and they, the idea is that they bring their own passion and their own interests and their own issues and they discuss them together and build those into campaigns and you really see uh, the leadership of, of young women over the over those over those years and the way that they're connected with one another so I think the passion is all there and I think sometimes perhaps our own structures stifle stifle that that passion so uh, on misogynist hate speech I completely agree with you Margarita and I think uh, in addition to all of the legislation that's needed we also need the, the social media companies to act um, much more seriously to put an end to the online abuse and hate speech misogynist hate speech against women on, on Twitter on Facebook on Instagram etc and it just they're not just they're just not doing enough so just to add to what others have already been saying We've done some um, really important work about, about the way in which the online space is actually really toxic for women uh, and girls and how, what can be done about that, both, and, and for politicians. I don't know who said earlier, but this is actually, Zita, I think, that this is actually a danger to democracy because women do not, no longer want to speak out. Women don't want to go into public life. And I think there's so much more that needs to be done to, we did a whole program of work in the run up to the European elections uh, to provide support and training to women candidates and politicians who are standing for election in the European elections uh, around how to combat report uh, online and misogynist hate speech, but also what political parties and parliaments can do to consider that as really a security issue and a safety issue. But I really want to insist that the social media companies and the billionaires that run them really need to be held accountable for the kind of um, well, what's happening online and what that's doing to democracy and what that's doing to women's voices. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Joanna. I read somewhere, but of course you read these things and don't know for sure if it's true that nine out of 10 um, billionaires are men, you know, and mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah, I'll just go on and on. But I wanted to give out a shout, a shout out to Ed for what he said in this chat. I'll just leave it there because um, because of what he what he wrote. So our, our final question tonight, unfortunately, but fortunately, is coming from Brenda. So thank you, Brenda. Yeah. I think it's really a comment to a lot of what I was uh, going to ask has been answered very, and I'm very happy about that. And um, the way the um, the um, the information that we got tonight has been so encouraging. I'm, I'm the chair of Liverpool for Europe, and um, I am, I'm, which is also part of Grassroots for Europe. But I am an active Labour member. We have uh, 15 out of 16 constituents. Um, uh, constituencies here which are Labour. We've got a lot of um, members who are part of Labour movement for Europe. I mean, it really bothers me that we've never had a, a female leader in the Labour Party in the UK, and um, whereas they've had two Conservative um, female leaders and Prime Ministers. And I was really um, encouraged by what Margarita said and about educating young younger men and uh, encouraging them to think about masculinity in a different way. Um, for those of us who have sons, I'm sure we're all very proud of the way that they respect and regard women. But as Jess said, we've done it all. When it comes to violence, what more can we do? And it would be really great to see at uh, vigils, protests, as many men and boys there as women as there were in the Black Lives Matter demos, when there were many people of heritage, um, ethnic heritage and uh, white British. So um, I'm really encouraged, but I'd really like us to go forward and to think about how we can integrate men and boys into, into what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. That, that's absolutely great. Um, I. Um, don't see any member of the panel who would like to respond. Oh, Zita, sorry, yeah. Actually, I tried to read carefully uh, the comments and uh, I'm very happy to see Ed, uh, who told that he's a bit shy, but I think this is the right place to, to learn from so many experienced uh, women. Uh, and uh, I would say, and that's a question to Jumpy. Jumpy, could, could you organize a, a type of um, similar webinar with uh, with young people, you know, who can who can who can just talk about uh, their life and uh, what's up and what type of solution labor can offer for for young people. Because uh, I would say that would be really cool, and I can tell you how how uh, how important uh, young people are in in uh, in in uh, in my life because. I would say uh, these young people need role models. They need good role models. And of course, uh, uh, this is a trustless world. And I think to build trust back, uh, that people should trust again each other. I think this is, and, and missing solidarity, that this is really something that we should, uh, we should, uh, we should uh, uh, take, uh, take this into consideration and probably, uh, as uh, this COVID-19 pandemic is like an uncharted water. So, so let's see how can, how can we take the good things in, you know? Uh, I, we got the chance, you know, to meet in the virtual sphere. Uh, now, the, today to be in London and New York and in the Hungarian parliament at the same time, you know, it looked a mission impossible and to, to be in Brussels at the uh, FEPS bureau. Uh, but, you know, the virtual sphere really helps, you know, you know to, to, to be everywhere in a way. So that's why I believe that let, let's use this virtual sphere, which is not replaceable uh, with, uh, with the personal uh, touch, but I think I'm happy to, to come back again because I miss very much my labor uh, friends uh, uh, from uh, not only from uh, from the European Parliament but from from the European uh, sphere. So so let's see how can we connect in a way uh, again. So assigned female abursement. Okay, yes, okay, I got it. Ed. So thank you. That's the comment I just wanted to make.
Thank you, Zita. That's absolutely wonderful. And we'll hold you to that to come back to the UK, whether it's virtually or in person. Absolutely. You're welcome wherever, especially welcome in Wales, that's for sure. Um, uh, I just wanted to make um, a couple of comments. Um, there's one comment in the chat that I want to mention, and, and then there's some closing comments that I've got. Won't take long, I promise. Um, so I've had a, a comment from Owen about um, we've had an amazing 90% women-led campaign going with Julie Ward as, as part of the organizing group. The UK never signed up to the European 18-month limit on detention of asylum seekers, immigrants, Yarlswood, Penali, which is near Tembe, and other immigration removal centers are being closed down in line with the policy to reduce the Home Office detention estate. Yet the Westminster government are attempting to open a new um, immigration detention center um, at uh, Medhamsley Detention Center in County Durham, especially for women, possibly children. Is there anything we as LME can do to bring European support and solidarity to our no to Hasek Field campaign? I'm sure that um, definitely LME and members themselves can also uh, do things about it, like uh, writing to this government, although I don't know how open this government is to, to, to change. It's very, very difficult. But if you don't ask, you don't get. I always think that it's, it's push, 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 always push, 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 and get others to help as well. And um, when it comes to immigration and asylum, it is not just a European Union issue, it's a human rights issue. It's a United Nations Convention on Refugees, 1951, which applies. And of course, it's Council of Europe as well. Various different conventions apply. So don't let it be put off by the EU, um, not being part of the EU, because this is much bigger uh, issue than the, the European Union. So um, just a couple of comments from me, um, if, um, if I may. And one is about the Conference on the Future of Europe. It has been signed into a, a practical declaration now. It's going ahead. It's going to start, I believe, on the 9th of May 2021, and it's going to run for a year or more. And the conclusions are going to come out in 2022. Now, when I was in the European Parliament, I was trying to push um, various MEPs who might have been in, um, helping be in charge of it to see whether there's any space for, you, for the UK, either NGOs, the civil society or institutions, not necessarily the Westminster government because that would be problematic, but I understand the constraints, to have a representative voice within the Conference on the Future of Europe. Because as far as I understand it, it's Europe in the wider sense, it's not just the European Union sense, but not just that, it's learning the lessons from why we had Brexit as well and having a voice continually say, this is the, these are issues that might come up for the future of Europe because we want to see a wonderful European Union. We want to see a bright future. So that's my plea to, to think about that and have a look on the website as well and push as well. And I know that I lobbied our Welsh Labour government in, in, in Cardiff about it and they were very open. They wanted to hold a meeting in, if that was possible with it in Wales and were, would be very delighted, I'm sure, to, to have a virtual meeting hosted in Wales, if it's a parallel event or something. Please do bear that in mind. Thank you. I want to, first of all, thank, um, thank you all for coming. Absolutely wonderful. And those who have left already, I know it's getting late, but thank you so much for coming. This, these events aren't possible without you. Please do join the LME. It's a wonderful organization. You can get their emails and their newsletters, et cetera. And I wanna thank Champy and Harry for all the work they do behind the scenes and they're still online as well. So thank you so much for organizing that and for resending documents that, that go into the ether and organizing me as well. I wanna thank in particular, of course, our panel, our wonderful women panelists, Tulip, John, <laughs> Gronia, Joanna and Zita. Without them, our life will be so much um, less colorful. Such powerful women, wonderful to have you and be on the platform with you. And thank you very much, everyone. I want to finish by saying this. We need allies, we all need allies. And we need all of us to stand together and to fight together. As Groenje has outlined, when people work for a common goal, they can achieve anything. 
who would have thought about marriage equality and abortion in Ireland? I just, you know, it beggars belief. But when we work together, instead of dividing us, like Joe Cox has said as well, we can achieve massive things. We can achieve many things, as in potentially going back into the European Union. We have to have a national conversation. And I'm in favour of a citizens assembly on this. I think it would be a wonderful innovation. Maybe that can be part of the conference on the future of Europe at the side, at the margins. A, a people's assembly about our future in Europe. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you again for everything that uh, has been said and thank you very much for your questions and your comments. Good night, everyone.